All right, so let's go back here. All right, so the post, the announcement on the stream tells you what I was hoping you'd do before class. So you're gonna come with some information about how has the work-life balance, how is that in your country and how has COVID affected it? Um, what's going on, right, with women based on research? Um, then what I'd like to do, have you do in your groups, and I hope this will take longer. I mean, we have time. The class periods at AUW are longer than they are at Lyon, and I like that. It gives you time to just talk about stuff. So um, Sadia was talking about her mother and how uh, you know difficult that was for her to, to balance work and family and what her mother did about that. So go ahead and tell your stories, your moms, your aunts, your grandma, your sisters, your cousins, um, you know, whatever stories you think you have. I would imagine a lot of women, you know, have a lot of stories. Then the next thing would be to link that with what you can find in research is how do those personal experiences fit with overall trends, right? And what has changed over the last 10 to 20 years? And then how has COVID affected it? Because this article talks about how COVID has affected all of this in the USA, which of course is one of the developing countries. So, you know, you really kind of want to know, well, how is it affecting, I mean, America is a developed country. So how is it affecting women in developing countries? Um, is it the case, which happens might be true that if your mother or aunt or whoever has a good enough job that they might get more protections or more uh, com compromise, more flexibility than if, there, if your mother has a less um, what high on the on the socioeconomic ladder, a lower class job. How about women and um, uh, first responders, you know, the ones who deal with the public directly. So how many women in general deal directly in the kinds of jobs? that are much more likely to catch COVID. And that's true in the US too. Lower class jobs tend to be more hands-on dealing with the public. Plus those are the jobs that couldn't go online, right? Unlike my job. So how has that affected women? Have they quit their jobs because they are those first responder kind of jobs? And then are there government programs, UN programs, NGOs that are trying to deal specifically with that problem? Then um, in case you actually brought, you had done some reading and that was one of the topics. Um, so right at the last minute, I decided just to look up some stuff on the AUW library site. And of course, I know you all know how to do this and it's not a problem, but I can at least um, show you, right? If whatever kind of research you wanna do, I think there's going to be stuff. Um, sometimes I send students out and, and they can't find anything. And I can, you know, I understand that, but here's another, one uh, cross-cultural review of certain Asian that's a little more broad. And this one is um, work-life balance. Okay, so I found a lot of stuff and um, I don't think that'll be too hard for you. You just pick the topic you want, but for starters, 
for the first round of discussion. Um, why don't we just talk about, I had you do page 10 to page 33, the impact of COVID-19. It's been hard for all employees, but it's been particularly hard for women and women are leaving the workforce, right? Lack of flexibility. Um, these were the reasons. And if you think that this is just the problems of an elite, right? The problems of women in developing countries um, and women in develop, I mean, developed countries, women in developing countries, just they don't get far enough up in a company and they don't get, they just don't have enough privilege to even be able to have these problems. So I'm not sure. I think that it's important for me to know, you know, that this is a heads up. This is not something women from developing countries think about at all, which shows you, you know, again, there tends to be this division among women. And so um, that's, that is one um, issue. Let's see, but I think in any country, pushing mothers out of the workforce might be true in any developing or developed country. The reasons they get pushed out might be different. Um, so let's see. And then also, does ethnicity and race, do you have in your countries, I mean, some obviously, but what particular race or ethnicity issues do you have? And do women who are of a minority race and ethnicity or religious belief, right, culture, do they have more problems than majority race and religion and ethnicity women in your countries? Um, do women feel more harshly judged in your countries? Um, there, I guess there are um, similar problems. This woman was a leader of a 200 person team. So not too many women anywhere are like that, but they run into these same problems. Um, the next issue is that companies, this is really important. And I Again, I wonder if this is also true in developing countries. I think it's very possible. I mean, my bet would be that it is true, that when women are well represented at the top, the companies are 50% more likely to outperform. That's amazing, you know? And I, that would be interesting to know if that's true everywhere in the world. Um, then the problem again, is that if you're minority, you have more problems. This one was um, specifically the George Floyd. I live really a couple miles from where George Floyd was killed. And there's a memorial there and everything. My son used to live really close to there. And my daughters went to high school um, just a, a matter of blocks from there. So that was a big issue, but at work, these women felt uh, not supported, like workers didn't even talk about it, which is pretty awful. And again, I don't know if I'm, I would gather that happens in developing countries too, that women, women's issues, minority is just silenced or invisible and, but they're expected to work at the same level. Um, People who think that they're not racist don't really take action. They don't take a risk. Um, and intersectionality is another important for uh, issue for women in all all around the world. Like if they are having if work life balance is negatively affecting their marriage or not. Yeah. If the kids are if they feel more guilty because other, other of their children's friends, their moms are not working. And so they get more annoyed. They're not patient with their mother. They blame their mother or things. 
I know my sister, that's how she felt about my mother when my mother went back to work. She was in like first grade or something, um, maybe second grade, but she didn't like it because her friend's moms didn't work. I didn't mind it. I, my mother was a scholar, smart. I don't know. I didn't think a lot about it at all, actually, because um, I was old enough. I was independent. Um, but that intersectionality, right, is that they have to deal with, maybe they have more to deal with with their marriages, their roles as mothers, their respect in the family. Maybe it's more respect. Maybe it's less than their performance at work. These people feel like they're being judged more, that they're, um, that, you know, they're assumed not to be able to cope with it. But, um, okay. All right, I think that was all that I asked you to read. So you could think about which of these issues is true everywhere and which of them is just, you know, privileged white folk problem. Um, all right, so I will let you screen share with each other. Whoops, wait a sec. Um, yeah, I will put this on multiple screen share if you want to. Um, do that in your groups. And now, uh, yeah, I will send you out into. Uh, so pick, someone should lead and make sure everyone talks. And you don't have to all absolutely take turns. It doesn't have to be rigid. But make sure, you know, that everybody gets to have their say and you can ask each other questions and take as much time as you need, right? We have time. Uh, uh, yes? You shared a link on Google Classroom. What does that? Oh, uh, for I'll go, uh, yeah, I'll go to that next after this, okay? Okay. Okay, yeah, one thing at a time. Um, there you go. But that's a good question. I mean, I did. And, you know, when I do that at the last minute, it means I don't want you to do any more homework, you know, than I assigned. I'm just going to talk about it in class. So it's not your responsibility or anything. Um, so there you go. Um, so in respect to uh, domestic violence, it's increased. The reason I haven't brought it up yet is because Persephone is the goddess who was raped and abducted. And so that'll be the main topic when we get to the goddess Persephone. Um, that's just another dimension of life, right? And so that's what I wanted to try and get yeah, that everything does blend together there's intersectionality but you can all you can also sort of separate them out that certain each woman uh well certain women have this one goddess that sort of dominates the others and other women have various combinations and of course they change over time but um that's why i hadn't brought it up yet um but I'll just say that everywhere I think domestic violence has increased because people are stuck at home. And I'm sure there's research again on that. Um, all right, so that's a good question. I think I'll put it on hold for a, a minute. So- uh, Professor, so our question was what sorts of what sorts of domestic violence are actually taking place in U.S. due to the pandemic? Because uh, domestic violence also has a lot of forms, right? Yeah, and also people interpret it differently, right? Exactly, Professor. So the same behavior to someone in one 
place might just seem like, well, this is what's expected is that you just put up with it. And other uh, countries, no, <laughs> it's against the law, right? Um, but there's also women within each country that are willing to put up with stuff that men are not. I mean, that women in a, within that country, for example, I'll just give you an example and then I should probably get the subject, you know, back to the, what we've done so far. But, um, all right, so rape within marriage. How many of you live in countries where a woman who feels like she's been raped by her husband can actually go to court and get him arrested? We have laws, something for marital rape, but I don't think it's practiced properly because women themselves don't file a case in this because people say that this is so nonsense because husband can do anything for them. So um, this is the case, case is here. We have a um, like law, but no execution. Right, so what <laughs> country is that? It's Nepal, Professor. Yeah, I, I should remember that. But anyway, all right. So actually, this is the kind of thing I want you to talk about when we get to Persephone. Does that make sense? But I'll just say this one thing, that the U.S. passed a law in 1994, which isn't that recent, but that in our country, we have federalism. We have states' rights. 38 states all passed laws that said, if he gets taken to court for that, he gets amnesty. <laughs> He's instantly forgiven. So basically they completely undermined the law. So if you live in Arkansas, don't bother bringing it to court. If you live in Minnesota, yeah, you could you know, get some legal protections or censure. Um, and then there's always the problem of once you take your husband to court for rape, are you going to go back and, and sleep with him again? Are you going to live with him? I mean, isn't that sort of like divorce? <laughs> um, so there's just the practical problems. But anyway, that that's called, there's a name for that, that you have a right de jour according to the law but you don't have it de facto as a matter of fact women will never uh get that legal status those rights because of the context um but anyway it's a good question and let's talk about it when we get to that goddess um all right so let's go right now to um, the screen share. And then one student uh, wondered, what was that link that I sent? And um, so let me show you what it was. We can start it. I'm not gonna do the whole thing, it's an hour. But it's, you might be interested in this particular center, it's the, uh, Berkeley Center for Peace and Justice. Um, well, actually, the Berkeley morning. Center. Uh, okay. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, in the time-honored uh, COVID era, uh, welcome to this important webinar. Uh, we're focusing on Bangladesh and focusing also on uh, a learning effort on a topic that we see as of critical importance, which is what's happening particularly to girls uh, but also, of course, to young people and to people more generally uh, in terms of education uh, in the COVID pandemic. Uh, we know from many places that during crises when schools shut, uh, girls tend not to go back. They tend to suffer more domestic violence, and there's quite a bit of evidence of increases in child marriage, among other issues. Uh, so this uh, event is centered around a new brief that we will describe that looks particularly at religious dimensions of these very critical problems. 
Um, to give you some of the standard uh, provisos, this event is being recorded uh, and the video of the event will be available, will be sent to all who registered, uh, but it will also be available on the Berkeley Center WFTB uh, websites. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, you can uh, raise questions at any point in the Q and A uh, that is at the bottom of your screen. I think those are the critical housekeeping issues. Um, so with that, uh, once again, the focus today is on girls, and we know the critical importance of education of girls may be the single most productive investment that any country and society can make. Uh, and that is why we're focusing so sharply on some of the dangers. So Samia, you're sitting in Dhaka. Um, at the Brack University, where you have multiple roles. Uh, I think you're also an anthropologist, and the CVs of our colleagues are on the uh, Berkeley Center web website. But Samia, could you situate the situation in Bangladesh, both in terms of what you're seeing and what you know, perhaps even any questions you have, um, areas that you think we should focus on, and, and describe it in terms of our our partnership and our um, our relationship. So over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Very good morning to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's joining us from wherever you're joining us from. Uh, um, thank you. I think, Catherine, this is a very, very timely event. Uh, uh, just because, you know, the COVID uh, pandemic, I, I think, has left a certain kind of uh, impact that we don't really we don't see going away um, uh, very soon, not in the very near future. And it's especially in Bangladesh, which uh, some estimates say that we've had the longest school closure of any place in the world. And the kind of disruption to education, to teachers, and to the learning process that that creates. So, you know, one, the one point is that we're going to have to try to recover some of these losses, but also I think we have to remember that these the losses that come to us right now are not coming to us in a vacuum out of the blue. There have been certain education challenges that we've uh, been experiencing in Bangladesh for a while. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it there, but I. I hope, you know, that you would like to finish listening to it, although this can be supplemented with um, research. And so whatever you prefer, some of you might like listening. There were two people right from Bangladesh and they had, you can sort of look up their publications. You can check their names and see, you know, check out what they've written for a research paper. That particular topic was related to education. So that's uh, from, that would be more like related to Apollo. Um, let's see. So what I wanted to talk about was the papers and just make sure to go over that. So that's clear to everybody, answer questions. And then I'm going to, let me, I'll show you the syllabus. And I'll show you where I'm going to cancel the next class. But then the class a week from today, you really have to be prepared because I'm going to ask each student to present a summary of their paper, the thesis and the argument to all of us, right? So we have something like 16 students, five, 10, 15, well, actually 20 students. So you'll each have um, about five minutes and I think you can do it, but you have to, you know, be really well prepared. So all you need to think about for this class, um, well, you have to do your post for the end of this week and then do, um, do the paper. So let's look at the requirements. Let's look at, um, 
Oh, see if I can figure out how to get this off of here. Oh my goodness, this is me. Um, okay. All right. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, I punched the wrong buttons. Okay, I'm gonna shut that down and shut that down and go back here and go to the syllabus all the way at the bottom and explain here's the paper again i you know i don't like to to um treat you like you can't read or something but i do want to make sure that everybody you know is on the same page and it does happen sometimes you can do research on a person an institution, an organization that promotes women's rights. I guess if you wanted to do uh, women and the work-life balance issue, um, women and the environmental movement, women and whatever, you could do that more generally thing, more general topic. It's, let's see. So let's go to the, okay, here we have, today was, we did Demeter last time, and then we did Women in Economics, Juggling Family and Career. And I didn't assign these things, right? I found something new because I'm, I really want to do stuff that relates to the students that I have. And so on the 26th, we're not going to have class. I'll change the syllabus and post that. And then on the 28th, you really have to be prepared. And there is a four point rubric attached to the first day of class. It's about uh, speaking, you know, and it's just common sense, right? That your presentation has a central idea and that you present it in an organized way and that you project well, right? You just do the usual speech stuff and then you can answer questions. So my rubrics, some rubrics get so dang complicated. They just drive me nuts. Like I can't think of all that stuff. So I just ask my students, you know, straight on, just have a thesis, have an argument, project, and answer questions. That's pretty much it. So that's that. Um, any questions on that? Because then I'm gonna go to specifically to the paper rubric, right? Um, why don't I go, I'll go to the sample paper, which I put up here. Um, and there we go. So I have a paper rubric and then I have a sample paper. And I think if I, if I show you the sample paper first, that I'll go to the rubric and say, well, yeah, it does follow that. But if you started with the rubric, you could end up with a different kind of paper and that's okay. It's just that you have to make sure you follow the rubric. You make sure you have that. So here she is following us. I think what all of you did, I think in access or whatever, those two, <laughs> whatever you did pre-UG, um, but you have a background. So her thing was climate change and economic growth in Bangladesh. Obviously, if I'm asking for this relatively very short paper, with just three, re three um, references, you're not gonna cover the whole topic. So she just gives kind of a general idea. Bangladesh has made big improvements in economic development, but climate change, right? A lot of the development involves fossil fuels, uses of resources, things that make climate change worse. So that's the main problem, right? The main claim 
in order to save lives while also supporting the economy, the, the development sectors have to come up with a greener strategy, right? Therefore, um, if, you know, they have to because both the economy and the environment will be improved. So I hope you understand that. That's just, you know, it's a thesis. It's simple. It's direct. She tells you exactly what she's going to do. Um, and so you could have something like um, educating girls and uh, development, right? Uh, in Bangladesh or in whatever your country is, you know, and that on the video, we just saw that the education of women is one of the best investments for development, right? So you could have a thesis like that and you could have your three resources and um, something like that, or you could have something like um, the one of the major setbacks, one of the worst aspects of COVID is that it is likely to uh, set girls back in their education and that will have a terrible effect on the future of developing countries or my country or whatever. So just some thesis, um, then you look up like today, I had work-life balance, right, in developing in Bangladesh. And I just picked three articles, but you'd have to have a thesis, right? Once you read a few things and then you decide, okay, I'm just gonna come up with this claim. I'm gonna focus on this. Um, why is it significant? And that's important, right? You just explain why this matters, right? Um, uh, if the factory owners consider zero waste or minimizing waste, um, they'll be protecting the environment, blah, blah. Okay, so she, why is it important? And I assume all of you are going to pick something that really is important. Then the, the research. So, yes. Professor, sorry interrupt, but then in the significance part, do we write uh, why our topic is significant or right. what? Yeah. Yeah, just why okay. Go ahead, um, thank you. it might seem redundant and you might decide, you know, if your main claim is that one of the worst uh, consequences of COVID is that young girls are, are leaving school or child marriage is going up. Um, you know, it's obvious it's significant. So I'm not, I wouldn't mark you down if you didn't include this section, um, but it would just be another sentence or two. If you wanna read over her paper and why she included this additional paragraph and, um, but really that's optional. It's just that I think this is a standard format that you're going to run into at AUW again and again. So I think I'm giving you practice for what you'll do in the future. Then the research method, um, secondary research qualitative includes non-numerical, numerical. So I think you distinguish between um, numerical, non-numerical and qualitative and quantitative analysis. Um, the quantitative is the number crunching. So the study that I had you read assigned for today, Women in the Workplace, if you notice it had some paragraphs, some qualitative stuff, and it had some individual interviews, quotes, and then it had the quantitative, it has the numbers. And then during class, I said, you know, start out with some examples of people, and that would be sort of the equivalent of an interview, right? And then you go research, is this a general trend in your country? So I, that's what I think is a real asset to going to college is that you, you have personal experiences, but you can figure out, is this a trend? And then you can go do research. It's not just about you, right? 
And if you get really obsessed about something and you think something's really important, you need to base that decision on, yeah, I've been hurt by this, but is it just me? Or is it something that really needs to change? And so that's, um, that's why this combination of qualitative and quantitative is good. Um, let's see, um, how is the research done? Things like that. So you can look that over. Um, the data collection, okay, she explained um, what sources she went to and um, the years, 2000 to 2021, the key words that she searched. Um, uh, so again, I, I never wrote papers like this through my college career. Um, I won't count you down oh, if but, you uh, have it, but I think, yeah. To, need to write this data collection or data analysis like this way. Like, I think it's so. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, all I'm saying is that what I'm saying here is that it, I'm not going to count you down if you don't, Delana. It's just that it might get you in the habit of doing something that you'll have to do quite a bit later on. In the on. previous, uh, previous, like when we were in Access Academy, we, we write uh, our research paper is not this way, like it's so simple way, but there is some uh, like a segment like data analysis and data um, and uh, data collection or something like that. We didn't do this, like. Uh, you didn't have to do this? No, okay. we don't. No, because Professor, in the, yeah, in the methodology uh, uh, part, we just write all about the data. Okay, all right. So research limitations, literature review. Um, okay, the literature review is, um, is the argument, right? The paper's first argument, blah. Yes, the literature review is about the, like, <clears throat> the sources that we found in the, like, uh, Google scholars or gesture, something like that. And we, we collect some information from them and we have to write our, like, uh, uh, argument, uh, like, we right. submitted our argument, right? This right, right here, the paper's first argument, right, is that industrial waste minimization will help both the environment and the economy. We okay. have to give evidence to support our argument or like right. what in the set. You know? Right there. That's that's the the meat. That's the most important part is what she calls literature review. And then let's see, where's the second point? The second argument is that in Bangladesh, promoting sustainable agriculture will be economically beneficial as well as prevent further climate change, right? And so that's the main thing is, and then the conclusion. So, so if, if all you want to do, if you want to skip some of these other parts, that's okay with me. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't know what you did in access or not. Um, okay, so I think what you need, what you absolutely have to have is your main claim, right? That's number one. Yes. And then you should have a sentence or two about why it's significant. That might be in the main claim. Those could be combined. Yes. And you don't have to have the methodology or the data collection and data analysis and the limit um i don't know you could uh you could have the limitations but that's all right the main thing is the main idea the um the significance and then the thesis the literature review okay and you guys can write this down if you want to all right. 
one thing like uh, okay. when we like uh, sir, collect some data or some information like uh, here uh, she uh, uh, like mentioned about some interview and like uh, go to the field work to research her paper but we don't have enough time to do this like because it's no. a, it i don't think she did she didn't go out to the field so no no you don't have to research you don't have to interview people um i think she got all of this she read interviews that other people gave uh, can you go previous like uh, there is something like that i have already read it about uh in the previous one like uh so i thought it was all from these websites yes and the first maybe the first one there is something like uh, mentioned about some yes this one secondary research is an interview and visiting the factories business areas and fields right but she didn't do that oh uh, it's about the sources that the people are doing this right definitely oh okay. oh my Alana uh, I would never make you do that no no <laughs> Okay, no. okay. No, I no. was very scared about that because no, like I'm, you don't I'm sorry, I'm glad you asked because the paper is based on secondary research, means I didn't do any of it on my own. Oh, okay, okay. Right. That's that's primary research. So okay. it, yeah, very good question though. That would have been really scary. Um so that's Research method is basically these articles are secondary research. And you could just say that. I don't care. The, you know, just here's, here's what you need. You need a main claim. You need a sentence or two on why it matters. You need just a sentence saying this is all secondary research, right? Based on what I've read. Okay. And then what I read came from respected sources. Okay? Okay, I got it now. Thank but you. That's, those are all good questions. So instead of a whole paragraph for this, just a sentence. That's plenty. Um, uh, you can, I don't know. Let's see. Um, I don't think you need that. I think once you say it comes from respected sources, that's we it. I think we don't need to add the data analysis because we have we are like uh, uh, got the information and we analyzed it, and then we we should like we are able to write some information in our paper so we don't need to mention this like data analysis or something yeah like. yeah that's yeah. fine professor uh, are you not gonna like list a reference list for our uh, paper yes you definitely yeah. need that so the main thing is a, you know just a uh, main idea why it's important where you got your sources from and then your feed <laughs> And you have the references, and then definitely you have to have a conclusion, and then you have to have the bibliography, right? Excuse me, Professor. Yeah. So, Professor, uh, I would like to tell something to Dolana about the uh, data collection part and data analysis part. So, uh, when you actually do a research and present your research, then uh, people have to know how you collected your data, then you have to have your data analysis because without data analysis, nobody is going to understand what you actually researched on. So I think that whatever professor is presenting right now is the standard form. Uh, as uh, a high school student, I have actually did a research. I have written a 4,000 
research paper of myself and I actually followed this step. So, um, but my research was uh, uh, related to primary sources. So, uh, but then yeah, I uh, followed each and every steps that professor is mentioning now. Without these steps, then your research paper cannot be considered as a standard research paper. Yeah, okay. So, so be, um, because I have mostly first year students and all that, I won't be as picky, but that's what I was saying was if you want to learn the standard process, um, you would read over what she said, right? And you can understand what that particular category adds, okay? So what does this say? For this- Okay, I am, can I add something? Like I'm saying about that because like when we like found some sources to related to our topics, then we have to paraphrase it. We have to like review it and we have to like summarize this idea to add on our paper so i'm saying about this one because um like we don't need to like mention this one how we analyzed our like data so that's why i'm saying this like well, let's see what does she what does she, what does this add in this um though the main claim refers to the greener possibilities the collected counter arguments oppose the idea of greener solution and are biased toward economic or whatever. Therefore, the analysis is focused on a totally true outcome based on neutral analysis, okay? So that's how, um, so that you're analyzing all the stuff and how it relates together. Um, there are many steps to how it has been conducted successfully, right? are the articles that I chose. First of all, they're from good sources. And then are they, I mean, I an, analyze it. Um, the parts of the articles are properly synthesized, summarized and paraphrased. Yes. Right? So you're just, you, why did I choose these articles? Or um, I chose them because there's the evidence is that they are properly done. Does yeah. that make sense, Delana? Yes. Okay. So again, I, I didn't want to intimidate the UG1 students. I wasn't quite sure, you know, all they're getting in access and pathways and things. Um, but this is like, um, the other student said, like, if you want to learn this standard operating procedure and just get into the habit of it, then that's, this is a good example, I think. Um, and then the other thing, so my paper rubric is way simpler than that um, because I'm not in the social sciences. I'm in the humanities and, um, but it does have a clear thesis. It has arguments. They're reasonable. They're based on facts or assumptions that nobody disagrees with or authorities in the field accept. The arguments are logical. The textual references are appropriate and her paper does have appropriate references. The examples um, show the connection they're not too long or too short. There's a counter argument there. Um, and she referenced that. She said um, that the, the article she chose um, had some disagreements, but um, they're all legit, right? They do answer each other in legitimate ways. The paragraphs work. The grammar works, the quality of the paper. Again, it can be only be so complex when the assignment's pretty short. Um, it's complete, it's creative. So when you, you know, it doesn't have to be super creative, but her particular thesis is that it's, it's economic development in Bangladesh 
really needs to be tied to green uh, production because uh, Bangladesh is particularly vulnerable to that. Um, okay, and then it applies, it's important and it's fair. So this is, this is the um, rubric that I sent to my Lyon students. Um, and it wasn't based on a social science model, but for this paper, in other, in, to condition yourself into the AUW procedures, um, the other paper that I showed you is sort of is a model. And I think it's pretty simple and I think it's pretty clear, but do you have any other questions? Yours can be way shorter, you know, instead of a whole paragraph, you can just have a sentence. Um, it'll be tough in the import, yeah, in the beginning. It will be tough in the beginning. And that's why I really do enjoy working with students on their thesis statements and on, you know, how they're going to prove it. So I used to require that. And now I'm canceling a class hoping that you'll come. So I really would like you to come. The reason I don't require it is I used to just live pretty much in my office. So it wouldn't be hard for students to find me. Whereas now, you know, there's just certain hours in the day. I'm not as available as much, but um, I will be available on, what is today? <laughs> what is today? Your time. It's, well, it, yeah. it's not my day and your day is different. So this is, um, yeah, it's Monday for me, see, and it's Tuesday for you. So I have, yeah, I have to tell you that I am free on what is Thursday for you, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. Wednesday. Monday. Well, tomorrow I have another class at night. Oh, no. It's Friday. If Thursday is for you, then for us, it would be Friday. Uh, yeah. No, it's Wednesday for me, actually. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are, in the U.S. are my free days. So Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So it will be Friday, then? Uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in the morning. Saturday it, and, like, Sunday. Um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Your, so if it's your day. Thursday, then for us, it will be Friday. And no, it no, for you, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> it has gone. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, for you, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. Okay. For me, it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But, um, Again, I'm, I'm sorry, right, if it seems confusing. Um, I'm just making this transition. I'm trying to, you know, help you with social science research, which is not something that I've done. I do humanities, but I did want, you know, you, you need to learn this. Another thing that's really important is that, um, everything is changing, right? It's changing so fast that having people doing research and you finding out what's happening, right? What, what, you know, the idea that educating girls has always been such a big factor in developing countries. That's partly why the World Bank gave AUW so much money or money because it's a priority. So then that all the research on that has been done, all sorts of research. Well, then COVID messes it all up, right? And so you need more research, right, about how COVID is affecting it. And then what are we going to do after COVID? Like, what do you anticipate moving forward? So that's why, um, you know, this, this kind of research is so important and why just for me to help you learn how to get, develop those skills and get in the habit of sort of doing that is what I would like to do. Um, 
I don't know. Are there any other questions? And your other two papers are much more the traditional humanities kinds of papers. They're what is your idea of how we should structure things moving forward, right? So that's an idea. And um, you can definitely use resources, but you don't have to be as tied to the resources. It's, a, it's, a, it's similar and different. Um, and then the set, your second paper is which goddesses have possessed me, right? Which goddess do I identify with most or which balance, right? That's not a research paper. <laughs> That's straight out of your own psyche, right? That's you knowing yourself. What am I passionate about? You know, things like that. So this paper is sort of a standard one, moving forward in your career. The second one is moving forward in your life. <laughs> and the third one is trying to put those together. All right. Is that okay with people? And you can go, it's 1040. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye, ma'am. Have a yes, good day. Thank you, ma'am. I really to find out what you come up with. I really like learning from students. So. Yes, professor. Have a nice day. Bye.